Welcome, BBCS, to episode number 151 of the Broken by Concept podcast, the number one solo queue educational, informational podcast there is out there in the League of Legends community. We're going to start off with some news, Curtis. You know how, like, you know, the programs, like news programs, they start off with, like, um, general news and sports news and stuff yep. like that you know we are the solo Q news channel we are the solo Q news channel that's, that's what we right calling ourselves all right so this is an update the bbc yes we are a, a, a news corporation <laughs> how could we miss the that? british broadcasting is that right british broadcasting corporation that's us we're here live that's what the BBC stands for. From Australia. For. From Australia. <laughs> we're taking over. We're like a branch. Yeah, uh, that's right. We're a branch of their company. All right, Curtis. So this is a dev post from the Riot Games behavioral systems update as of May 2023. <clears throat> I'm not going to bore you guys with all the details. I'll uh, have a link in the uh, YouTube description. So um, essentially, they say that... They constantly try new strategies and approaches to improve their effectiveness in the space. We know that in the past, you've been the play base has been unsatisfied with the effectiveness of our behavioral systems to protect your League of Legends experience. So we've been applying your feedback and a large amount of research in the space to try new kinds of solutions to your most immediate problems. And the result has been promising. You've been telling us that our recent changes have made significant positive differences to how players are acting in your games. We know there's still so much more to do, but these changes are giving us a lot more confidence that we're moving in the right direction. And we're looking forward to making even more impact on preventing disruptive behavior from ruining your experience in your games. So it goes on to list some of the big changes we've introduced that you may have noticed. So these are things that are in the game right now. Automatic muting feature, which automatically detects zero tolerance chatting game, prevention of the messages being sent, system muting the player and making the action visible to all players, and a full integration with their upgraded game agnostic text evaluation service. Holy moly. (laughs) It's called the GATES. That's the abbreviation. Machine learning models allowing us to take action on over 15 times the amount of disruptive text than previously. We're thrilled to release this as it, it is something we've been working on for many months. So they've been making a bunch of changes. There's like a little graph. And this is where they've seen the increase in the following areas. So they player behavior systems successfully protect the game experience, increase of 7%. Riot Games implements effective programs for discouraging negative behavior, increase of 9%. And Riot Games implements effective programs for encouraging positive behavior, increase of 6%. What are some... Effective programs about positive, encouraging positive behavior. What does that mean? Is I that don't the know. tips? Is that, is that a tip? Honoring someone? Oh, oh, yeah, the honor system. Is that positive behavior? I would assume so. I don't know what they mean by that. Mm. Um, it's a good buzzword, though. Yeah. So Good PR. Yeah. yeah. So <laughs> we'll take their word for that one. <laughs> so what's next? So the key line that we're going to be looking at here and this is what a lot of people have been you know excited about is that we're talking about in the next few months we will be restricting ranked play for players who have been punished by our systems this means that you have if you are punished for disruptive behavior including intentional feeding multiple afks and severe chat abuse you'll be restricted from accessing the ranked queue and will need to play in other queues to re-unlock the ranked queue that's cool I think that's great. That's really cool. It makes a lot of sense, doesn't it? Right? Like if you've been punished in the past, you're going to have to earn to get back into ranked. Earn your entry into the mm. the, the dojo. So again, I'll link the article there, but, um, you know, just general, you know, everyone talks mm. about, you know, riots, you know, not doing it. Like they're doing stuff, guys. You know, they're, they're having a crack. They're just adjusting things, you know, like at the end of the day, like the MOBA experience is relatively new relatively new you know yeah. like i mean it's, we're 10 years into the game you might not think that's new but if you think about just the evolution in general of industries and games, when, like, when was hon right that's the first one right yeah, dota but, and hon you know those those games you know like they didn't have the play base that league had at that time you know i mean i guess there probably is different chat. dota was pretty big Dota was pretty big dota was pretty big but steam chat works a little bit different and yeah stuff like that, right? I, I don't know we can't really comment on yeah, hon and dota right we don't really i don't think we didn't play that so you know so right but, like, but still it is relatively new for us, like the company that's like, you know, trying to, 
you know, solve these problems. These are complicated problems yeah. to solve. We mentioned in our, you know, our Bob... At scale. That's at the, scale. Again, they're yeah. not... They're not complicated in isolation. They're, they're complicated at scale and doing it in a way that doesn't disrupt the average person's league experience because you've got to remember, right? They they, they they want to be very careful here, right? Because they don't want to punish the wrong person, you know? And obviously yeah. disincentivizing the wrong person to play the game is definitely not in line with their business model, which is getting people to play the game and buy skins, right? So they're trying to be very careful and take it baby steps, which you know, makes sense. Yep. Does yeah, does make sense. Yeah, something that's very yeah fragile, right? And you got to take it, take it slow, and keep testing and stuff like yeah. that. Yeah. So, I mean, that, but I think that's that's really cool. Um, and and I because I the way I envision this, right? Someone's had a bad game, they're angry, they rage at someone. It's probably best they take a break anyway, mm. right? It's kind of like a forced way of a break. But if they still want to play the game, you can still play. Just queue up just out not rage ranked. killed, and then you're even more angry. Do your like yeah, <laughs> yeah. So I, I we'll see what this is like in application, like whether it's like you're forced to play an X amount of normal games. Like, is it just one normal game, or is it many? You know how many? Or maybe does it depend on the severity of the of the case? I don't know. These are. I mean, it's not. A, this is not live, right? This is not coming out now. No, this is what they say. The next few months, right, right. We'll be strict in rank play for players. Yeah, I think it's great. I think it's really, really cool. Was okay. that the main thing? Was there anything yep. else? That's that really it. what I want to cover. Cool. So I think that was cool. Cool news to share. And right? it's good to know that they're thinking about it. Yes. And they're f trying to figure out ways to create a better league experience for all of us, especially in solo queue. I like it. All right, we've got more news, Curtis, more articles, more headlines. Next up on the BBC. What's next on the agenda, Nathan? <laughs> uh, this literally feels like a new show, doesn't it? Gen G Pays, is that how you pronounce his name? Mum hired a full-time live in Tudor, but not to help him with his studies. So this is an article on, uh, it's called One Esports here. Um, so at just 17 years old, he's not only the youngest bot laner to win an LCK championship in his first rookie season, but also received the finals MVP award. Um, so yeah, he was recently in MSI with Gen G. Unfortunately, they didn't make it to the finals. So it goes here, while his peers were busy preparing for university entrance exams, getting tutors and attending private extracurricular, extracurricular academies, Pays was receiving home-based tutoring for League of Legends. And then it has a quote here. When I told my parents that I wanted to be a professional League of Legends player, my mom's friend introduced me to a former professional player who would come by my house to help me rank up in solo queue. The tutor would visit his home two or three times a week, providing valuable tips and tricks to help him climb the ranks. The lessons allowed him to master specific champions and become a better solo ranked player, for it was important to gain a high LP to attract the attention of professional teams. How cool is that, Curtis? Uh, the, the top comment of the Reddit thread was, this is what we have to compete with, man. And that's sort of like saying from the West, from, from the West, NA and stuff like that. You know, like, a, should we start calling ourselves tutors? Is that? I think it's such a cool, yeah. Culture, I, I, right? And again, I, you know, Get this is not this tutor. podcast is not really about esports. But I think what's really cool about this is that it's, I guess, recognizing that solo queue can be taken seriously, mm. and and solo queue um, being encouraged as well, being accepted as like a a way to genuinely get you know get better at the game, get recognized. Um, and parents, you know, viewing, I'm going to hire someone like, like, okay, this is a skill, right? Because to hire someone, you got to recognize it as a genuine skill. Like a piano tutor. Like right, you hire a, math tutor, a language um, tutor, yeah. you know, learning Mandarin or Italian, whatever it might be, right? So, you know, it's a step in the right direction for recognizing league as a skill that you get better at. That's what I care about, right? From this story. And it's very cool to see, you know, maybe... And, and we actually, I think we are kind of at the cusp. We're at the, the beginning of a whole new, um, I guess, a, we're at the start of this whole coaching revolution in a way, right? Where back in the day, if you said you got coaching, what, there was no coach. Yeah, there either, simply wasn't a coach. You're either, well, there wasn't a coach, but also you're either talented or you're not. That was That's that, right. the view. It's like you're either. Even though that sounds very silly now, back in the day, that was like, no one really took it as seriously. Even like thinking about it, you know, in my gaming experience, I don't know what it was like in WoW, but in Counter-Strike, there was no such thing yeah, as hiring no a, yeah, didn't you exist. don't get a coach. It's like this person, you either grind and you get better yeah. or that's really it. Yeah. And the best players were the ones that just grinded and just were talented or whatever it might be, right? I mean, you could get a coach from like a, you know, a top player, but as we know, like, let's say if you're a tutor or you're an mm. actual coach, you're able to explain things that's and right. have the experience of working with a bunch of different people and players. And, and knowing the, the order, the order the, of yeah, things. The, the order of what to teach and how to teach it. Again, it, it, league is, and this is the thing that people need to understand about coaching is that, you know, 
you can learn a lot from someone that's high ELO. Don't get me wrong. And they have the knowledge. Absolutely. But they might not, oh, not might, they most definitely do not know how to teach that skill in the correct order. Cater for that particular rank. Cater for that particular champion. And, 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 and there's a lot of assumed knowledge, a lot of invisible things. I actually had this conversation today with Charlie uh, off camera about wave management. Because I was showing him the, the mid lane school, right? And he was talking about, we had a discussion about wave management. And in my program, I actually broke down wave management into part one and part two. And we're kind of talking about why I did that. Wave management, what I realized teaching it is that there's the understanding, if you think about waves right now, right? There's the understanding of waves at a, just a baseline theory level. Like what is, if you look at a wave, what is happening with it right now in time? If we pause, we freeze. Assess what's going to happen. What's, what's going to happen in the next 20, 30 seconds? That's right. What, what is happening with it, right? But then the next level is, okay, now I know what's happening, but then where do I want the wave and how do I get it there? They're different things because you can know, okay, this the wave's in neutral state, but if I want the wave on my side frozen, how do I do that? You could shove and then bounce. You could, you know, you could allow them, like try and bait abilities onto the wave and get them shoving into you and simply last hit. Like this, they're, they're the how. Right, and then the execution of that and the understanding of how is a different a different thing. And a lot of people working with people in the MLS that wasn't intuitive at all. That's a whole skill in itself that we just assume, like, oh, just manage the wave, you know, just like especially when I first started coaching. Yeah, this is what you got to do with the wave. There was no question of how and why and all this stuff. There's this all invisible, small, assumed pieces of knowledge that we just take for granted because you played the game for ten years, right? So that's a, it's a small example of you know, uh, what coaching is kind of, I guess coaching is evolving and there'll probably be even more layers to that in the future in five years time from now. We might even cringe that we're even talking about wave management. You know, there might be, why would you even talk about wave management at the start? Maybe you should be talking about champ mastery stuff. Or how or, to hit a skill shot or something. Yeah, exactly. I don't know. I mean, this is what we're trying to figure out, right? But I think, yeah, it's a really great story. Um, and shows the direction of, of the game and the sport, right? I guess it gives a lot of validity, yeah, validity, validity yeah. to what we're doing here in the podcast as well. If you can identify it's that. It's encouraging, yeah. League sure. of Legends is a skill that you can break down and improve on. And I definitely think they have a better grasp on that idea in the East from what it seems like comparatively to the West. But mm. we're, we're getting there. Slowly getting there. We're so getting there. As I said, again, like eight, seven, eight years ago, it's like, you got a coach? <laughs> what do you need a coach for? You suck at the it, game. Even No, that's still now. Yeah, it's still now. That yeah. narrative is still very much, I mean, it's changing. But I mean, I, I hear that all the time. Like people in the Midland Academy, their friends say, oh yeah, it's cringe that you have to get a coach. Like, what is that all about? Is it cringe that you have to get a tennis coach because you want to get better at te tennis? Again, that's an, a pretty nasty narrative that is slowly getting... It takes some time to standardize that with yeah. uh, League of Legends and gaming in general. So there was a big patch recently, Nathan. Um, especially for mid laners. Items. Yeah. There's a lot of big changes for mid laners. A lot of items. Uh, the most notable one was the Lost Chapter, right? Lost Chapter now costing 1100 rather than 1300 Massive. Which changes a lot. And, you know, one of the the results of this is that there are differing lane starts now. Like, you can, it's, it's a lot more viable to go Sapphire Crystal start and then, you know, Futures Market and then get a really early Lost Chapter. That's a completely viable strategy on many champions. Just because of how cheap it is. You can literally, get, I think, if you see as well, get a Lost Chapter by way four, you know? And so, ultimately... My point here, and, and, and I've got a lot of questions, like, Curtis, what should I do? Should I start Dorans? Should I go airy with Scorch and Dorans? Should I go, um, you know, this uh, First Strike and uh, Futures Market and Sapphire Crystal? Or should I go C Pod? Or should I go D Shield? Or whatever. The, the, the list is endless. And, you know, I would say objectively, in, in a given meta, in a given rank, in a given server, you could make an argument objectively about which one probably is the most effective choice, right? Hence why meta is even a thing. There is meta within champions and there's meta even with styles of play, right? Which is technically the most um, effective. But, you know, the response I've been giving recently, I say, guys, you know, if you, if you enjoy going Dorrance, if you enjoy going Sapphire Crystal, if you personally f enjoy that and you f it feels better for you, just the way you perceive playing your champion, that is completely fine. We can make that work. And so the point I want to get across here, Nathan, is that it's important to own your style. Now, that doesn't mean it's the most effective, 
but you need to own it. In order to own it, you have to understand what the strengths of that are. You need to understand what the weakness is, and you need to do everything you can to, I guess, emphasize the positives and the strength of that that strategy and downplay the negatives. And a lot of the time we get so caught up, and I get this question even a lot in my Below Gold program about Curtis, oh yeah, like, you know, I've heard this person say this about this champion. I've heard this person say this about this champion. And, and yeah, they're all right. You can play it fast. You can do that. You can take that rune. You can build that, right? But ultimately, what I recommend is just a, a, a good, solid approach. And so you can pivot and try to learn all these styles and play around with it. But ultimately, what matters is owning a style and getting very good at a particular style. And what I mean by style is item, the pace at which you want to play the lane, the way you interpret your champion's identity, the mindset behind that, it's all just an interpretation. And so, you know, a lot of people get too, you know, they over, bogged down. They get bogged down in that stuff. What is the best? And this is why I don't do tier lists. People ask me all the time, why don't you do tier, tier lists like other content creators? Because it's bullshit. Tier lists are completely useless until Master Plus. Every rank below master, it's negligible. It's noise. It's actually distraction. It's distra- it makes you a worse player. It makes you a worse player. It's complete. Think about that. And this extends even to, um, I had a, a Zed client recently. Um, he came to review and we're getting into the details. A lot of people who would coach this Zed player would look at it and be like, oh yeah, a lot of stage one problems, right? Missing combos, rushing WEQs. And then they might even look at some of his decisions and be like, that's a stage two problem. That doesn't matter. That Rome's not that good here and there. Stage one, stage two problems. I get to about the mid game and I just get this really icky feeling with the way he's playing the champion of Zed. And then I said to him, look, there's no doubt you've got some stage one micro stuff we can work on. There's no doubt that we can improve your roaming and maybe some your map play. But the core crux of your problem is that you're interpreting Zed in the complete wrong way. You're playing Zed way too fast. We need to slow it down. Mm. Pretend your champion scales and actually get to the mid game, right? Now, where this led to it, because we kind of went on this little tangent here, and I said, what's going on here? Just give me me an insight into how you're feeling and what are you thinking in the game, right? And he says... Yeah, so funnily enough, I actually was a big time, a big, he used to play high, the Hydra's Conqueror skate, like more bruiser team fight style of Zed. And that was what he was known for. Mm-hmm. The meta shifted or like the whole, the, you know, the whatever the, the patch comes out. And, you know, everyone's saying that Yomu's with Electro is the best way to play Zed now. So he shifted style. But he had a narrative with Zed that now if I go this full lethality build, I don't scale. So he completely exploded his view of the champion. Now feeling like he has to do all this crazy shit, which he doesn't, rather than just owning. Dude, even if you're still going the Conqueror Z with a different build path, you can still go that stuff. Yes, it may not be the most effective, but just own it. You know what I mean? And so what his problem was not like, yeah, like there was all these other, yeah, stage one, stage two stuff, but that stuff is being affected massively by this stage three issue. His interpretation. His of interpretation the of the champ identity yeah. and how the and the mindset and what is he what's his role in a team comp. And the champ identity changes with build and runes. That's right. And so, you know, there's maybe even stage four stuff there. But my point being is that, yes, guys, it's and just very, very, very important to own the way you like to play your goddamn champion. I refuse to build Everfrost on Vex because mm. I hate it. I will only build Ludens, mm. even though there are games that are objectively better for Everfrost. Okay, I don't want to. I don't want to build it. It doesn't feel good. There's like a part that's actually really uh, relieving for owning your identity because your decision making just becomes very clear. And yes, uh, the, that's why one tricks are actually really good at the game and much better than like you know the general other, lots of other players is because. They don't care about any noise, dude. And they're just like fully like, this is how I play. Because if you play something, because remember, everyone's making mistakes all the time, right? If you're owning it and playing that identity, even if it's suboptimal to a perfection or even close to perfection, you will still have a massive impact in it, that game. What it's actually doing, Nathan, right, is is it's actually fixing a variable still. So think about it. If your if your build and your and your interpretation of the champ's identity, everything is just fixed. Fixed, yeah. It's this thing. Then you can only 
If that's just staying there, that's not moving, that's not budging. You can only look at the behavior and the gameplay and the decisions yeah. in the micro. Because you know why that's really good as well? Because you know the games that are so hard and you're happy to lose them. That's the key thing. Mm. Like, like the, let's say, for example, uh, my... Yeah, because you know the strengths and weaknesses of that setup. So you're never confused. You're not confused, yeah. And you're always like, okay, I lose those, th it's like 30% of those games, but then I'm going to be focusing on like those 70% of games that I can control. Um, for, I, for example... Um, my volley bear tank sort of style, which is very unique um, because a lot of people play like predator volley bear and, you know, really early game build, but I play more scaling volley bear. And, you know, let's say I, in games that I get, I'm against like a kindred and like an Ari and like these champs that like just can kite me and like, I'll never get a cute. Like, I just understand those games are like really hard or like, sorry, it was more like games where like people can chop down tanks and there's nothing I can do about it. Like let's say I'm against a kindred Darius. Like that's already a hard tank volley bear game. Um, and then like, I'm, you know, that's it. Like I, I'm, I'm accepting that, you know, I'm not accepting I'm going to lose. I'm going to still try, but I, I can move on very quickly and I'm aware of the clear strengths and weaknesses. I'm like, okay, I'm going to move on to another game. I'm probably not going to get these champs in the next game or I, you know, bam, maybe one of these or whatever. Yep. Yeah. You'll know exactly the games that are really good for your setup and exactly the games that are not good for your setup, but then you'll know, okay, exactly what you can do and exactly what you can't do. And then you're forced to really push yourself to that next level in terms of chair mastery. So like, yeah, this is the thing. And then, and, and so, yeah, we can get, we can get into all that stuff, refining your build and adapting all that. And yes, that, that is important eventually, right? At some point we can get to that, but Let's just really work on your gameplay. I got, um, so Envy, he's a long-term MLA member from Oris and he's recently picked up ASOL and I've tried to tell him just, okay, just, we're going to play ASOL and we're going to simplify the fuck out of your journey, right? And because I'm telling you, I play on the same server as you. I know exactly what to do because I've, I've played at like, you know, played ASOL recently a lot. I know what it feels like. I know what problems you're going to face. I could literally, you know how we say, if you've, if you've played that champion and you, you know exactly yep. what problems they're going to face, right? Yep. And he sent me he sent, he sent me this essay this morning about how, you know, these games, I, when I feel like I'm versing a lot of threat, it's really hard and I can't really W forward and blah, 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 blah. And I'm like, yes, that that is all true. You're saying everything that's true. But there's things that you could be doing in those games to maximize your impact. That might not win you the game, nope. but there is things you can do because I I've played those asshole games and you just got to adapt. You might not be able to W4. You might have to be really patient. You might have to give your first two towers and then clean up a team fight 35 minutes, but it's winnable, right? And just do that. And then, yeah, and then we can expand your champ pool later on because I feel like I just really want to go deep on that ASOL journey and, and get him to that next level of champ mastery, you know? So yeah, it's just a, a really important thing to fully internalize and feel owning your style owning your identity as a player very very important what uh and i guess people will ask okay well what happens if like uh, let's say a new build pops up for my mm. champion right and then uh it's like you know definitively effectively better do you think that people should just shift towards that yeah it's interesting it's really really interesting because again i had this conversation with an ivan mid player in the mla who he loves this this style of playing like a he builds like these utility items on ivan rather than building ap and then on paper the math behind uh full ap ivan is just better so i think it just gives you more shielding or whatever and more damage whatever um but he just doesn't like it just from a field perspective right even though from 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 paper it doesn't make sense and he and i feel like there's an element of like if you feel better playing it, you're just going to play better as well. So yes. I'm, I'm not going to say there's a definitive rule, like you should never adapt. Because again, with it, League, like we contradict ourselves every fucking episode because <laughs> League is this, this, it's this gray area. It's this constant gray area. We're mm. always living in the gray area mm. where there's no black or white. Mm. And so the answer is, should I adapt? Yes. Should I stick to my build? Yes. It's like both. So use common sense. You should be sometimes adapting to the build if it's a, a meta, if it's an extremely big shift, if they've got changed an item completely and it, that alters your champ's identity, um, or it'd be idiotic not to do it. But at the same time, you still got to own your identity and you interpret, you got to interpret that however you want to interpret that, right? Um, but going back to that point, what I said before, it's kind of like... Um, this is going to be, again, you know, we talk about staying in our lane, right? I'm going to try to stay in my lane, but I'm not at the same time. I'm veering out of the lane right now. My car's getting out of control. from my meth rant last episode. That's correct. Um, <laughs> so it's kind of like fashion. <laughs> 
<laughs> oh no good i'm not saying i know fashion i mean obviously people in this podcast know i have exceptional fashion with my rick boogs t-shirt and stuff yeah. we've got nathan over here with the die an old a die shirt that's like literally like, like 10 years, years old, old no shit. this is 10 years old oh, 20, 2014 yeah almost right. 10 years old well, that's concerning that you even fit in that still yeah <laughs> anyway. I just, it's just nostalgia dude just the back of the dial also, you know, I was so proud of this shit because this is the first merchandise I ever got printed for Direwolves. <laughs> yeah, and I love the back. Don't show the back, but I love yeah, the back. Yeah, the back. The yeah, back silly. Curtis and memes the back. Yeah, the back's funny. And um, anyway, <laughs> <laughs> when you, it's like when someone really owns what they're wearing. Like you can tell, you can feel like like people pull off some crazy shit. Like you walk down the street and that that guy's wearing some like mustard fucking like jacket and like some rainbow colored shoes or whatever. And like like owns it, you yeah. know what I mean? Like yeah. and like I couldn't wear that. Like I look like an idiot. Yeah. But that guy just suits him yeah. and like he owns it and he's rocking it and like he's ha- and he, you can tell he's not he's not like. Car. Worried about people being judging he's him. Not ju- yeah, he's not wearing a bit. He's not self-conscious at all. He's just chilling. Yeah, and and that makes it look good, mm. right? I, and I think that um, it's the same thing with League. Yeah, right. It's funny. I, saw, I, think I, I think I saw a picture of Kanye West because you know he has crazy yeah. stuff that he wears out. He literally just like wearing these blue socks as like no shoes, just blue socks. Right, <laughs> just walking around like right. it's normal. And he just owns it. Yeah, he just walks around like it's like oh, I just wear this every day. This is normal. Yeah, and we might say it is ridiculous, but. You know, at the end of the day, if he enjoys that, he enjoys that. And he probably looks confident. He seems confident doing it, right? Um, So, yeah, that's kind of like the way I interpret it anyway. Um, Okay, I want to shift gears away from fashion here a little bit. Um, Good idea. The quicker we get out of that lane, the better, (laughs) Curtis, I think. So, I was watching this segment between Broxa. It was like a little piece of content that they were doing, Broxa and um, Whippo. You know, essentially, you know, what they were talking about is, right, they obviously as a pro player, they do scrims all day, right? They practice with their teams all day and they jump into solo queue. And a lot of the time, you know, in what they were talking about in the NA and EU, you know, after their scrims, they don't take solo queue overly seriously. And a huge part of the reason, uh, the way he was saying that is because you verse Chim Bob in top lane who plays, let's say, Blipo, say you verse some random one trick and you know you go in lane you've been versing the best players in scrims and now you go in lane you're versing a guy that's objectively worse than the player that you were versing so your your intensity drops and uh they don't take it as seriously and then that becomes the norm the norm is now you don't take solo queue as seriously because you feel as though the opponent in his case just weren't that good right now the point i really want to take away from this and kind of explore with you here nathan is you know um, you get out what you put in. And, you know, I think all of us have been in scenarios. Like, I, I mean, I would say it's a very common narrative, especially in Oris and our server. It's always like you hear some random player in like like a master tier Oris player will say, oh, Oris is a joke. And then, you know, or you'll hear an NA, NA sucks, we're the worst region. Or EU, you know, we suck. You know, it, people always say that. It is shit, solo queue. And I still don't understand that. Like, that's just delusional. But they say they, it's comparatively to, to Korea and China, right? And, you know, and if you have that, what's going to happen is that you're inherently preventing yourself from getting max value out of the games because you're not playing with intensity and it's like you could go to the gym right and there's terrible equipment and you could sit there complaining oh the equipment shit right oh because the equipment shit i'm just not going to try i'm not going to put max effort and then therefore you get less result out of it it's the same thing and now people i'm going to probably get you know memed on by certain people I know how it feels to queue up and then you verse someone that's suboptimal of the game. I get that. And we've and even, and this is actually even still relative. You're in, say, P4. You queue up in a game and you verse some auto field mid laner. Like that can happen. You could verse a gold three auto field mid laner in a game as a P4. That could happen. Hmm. That's not unrealistic. There's other situations as well that I can recall even for myself where uh, the game gets so weird that it's like, okay, and then I just lose lower intensity. But I, if I could, like, figure out okay this is a weird game there's a lot of chaos use my brain figure out how to problem solve this game i'll get i'll probably learn a lot from that game instead of just being like checking out like oh this is this is this is a, a stupid game no point me trying in this one i've never left a game feeling like like i haven't it wasn't worth my time like in terms of like a game that isn't a troll like let's say there's an objective that's just not a troll it's just that they're, they're a worse quality opponent and let's say i just stomp them right 
there is always, 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 always things I can take away from that game. Things you can do better. I could have gapped them harder. I could have played mechanically better. I could have played certain skirmishes better and teamfights better. I could have called a bit a different lane assignment better. I could have got a better reset. I could have prevented him from ever getting the wave out or whatever Whatever it is. There's always things I can do better. But the thing is, is that you would never find those windows if you weren't playing with intensity. And so the moral of the story here, and, 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 and I'm, not, I'm not here to judge pro players at all. I'm not in their situation, so I'm not here to critique them. But what I am here to say is that, at least in my experience and for the people that I care about, you know, in our you know, in the BBC watching this and in our programs, you know, there are, and there's so, so, so many excuses for you to not give your all in a solo queue game. The list is endless. Think about it. You're hearing this from people that are pro players, let alone the average player. People I should, have been to world, they've been to world finals. At a this is their career, right? Yeah. And they're still finding excuses to not try, right? Think about the average player. Oh yeah, um, I had this troll on my team. This champ is OP. I got auto filled or I got secondary roll. Blah, blah, blah. The list goes on. You could make an excuse, any number of excuses to not put your in, put your best foot forward in a solo queue game. The reality though, and it's, it's a tough pill to swallow, is that the more you put in, the more you get out. But the more you put in, the more painful it can be as well. That's mm. that, and that's the that's the deal we all sign here, guys. Um, and just as a little bit of a tangent on this, and just follow up on this, I had a, someone in my um, Blow Gold program wrote a message to me, said this morning, guys, do you ever feel really bad after a, a set of bad games and you start walking away from the computer thinking like, what am I, you know, why, like, I just don't feel happy and I don't feel like, you know, this was a great experience. And I said, this is my response. I said, yeah. I have shitty blocks and I have shitty days where I'm like, well, I just didn't perform well. The games are just a bit sloppy. I didn't, I didn't, I didn't express my best self or whatever it might be. We all have those, but name me a hobby, name me a competitive hobby, a competitive outlet that doesn't consist of shitty days. Mm -hmm. You're going to go to the gym one week and you're going to feel piss weak. You're going to lift way lighter. Then, then one week you felt stronger. You're gonna play. You're gonna be maybe even say not not even not competitive hobbies. You're gonna try and um, play piano. One day you're just gonna be in. A, you're gonna be killing it in the in a vibe. You're really creative, loving it. One day you're gonna be like, I'm just not feeling it. I'm I'm fucking up. I'm making basic mistakes. This is I just get me off. Get me out of this piano. Same thing with art. Some days you're killing it. You're feeling it. Other you have days your off so. days. Sometimes. Yeah, everyone has off days, mm. but that's what makes the endeavor worth pursuing. Mm. Because if it was easy, and imagine every day was sunshine rainbows. Yay. Yeah, I always say that. that's one of the things think the, if what everyone, their pe whatever people's vision of perfect League of legends is, no one will play the game. That, that's right. Everyone wants, everyone thinks they want a utopia and then, and then they've never experienced what a utopia is. And if they did, they would never want it. They no. wouldn't play the game. No. It's like, uh, imagine if every game they were playing it, what they deemed to be well, not dying, free farming, getting to items, winning team fights. And it's all really what's easy. Yeah, what's the point? What's it's the just point? so easy. They wouldn't play the game. Nope. Let's say there's the rank system. Is it, there's no one you can't lose LP. It's just all sunshine and rainbows. Just you only yeah. gain thirty and lose five. Yeah, like, no matter what. <laughs> yeah, that's what people. That's generally. what we want. That's what they want. Yeah, they well, better don't think about the consequences. So no. when you're feeling like that, that's very normal, and that that's a sign that you're putting in effort. Great, mm. you mm. So, so it shows that you're caring about what you're doing. I love that, and that's the double edged sort of league. That is really the The more you put in, the more you get out of it. The more, the the yeah, the more intensity you have, the more painful some of those experiences are going to be. Welcome to be anything that you're putting effort towards. That that shows you're proud of what you're doing, and I think that's if anything, that's a positive sign. I think that shows that you're passionate, shows that you care, and it's going to be a lot more enjoyable experience as you start to get better at it, right? So I think that's a beautiful segue into the Simon Sinek thing, right? Let's do it. So Simon Sinek's obviously a really famous author. We've talked about his book before. Start with why. Start with why. Very, basically, my main inspiration for creating the the uh, the champion identity stuff was all come from his book, right? Um, so this is a little bit of a clip we're going to be showing. We'll play it through, um, and then we'll kind of maybe discuss a few ideas based off this. Something that we, we really want to try and do more on the BBC here is figure out ways to articulate, I guess... Uh, our message? Our message in a much more clear manner, right? We Where struggle sometimes. We struggle, 
All right. And so Simon Sinek is an excellent communicator and an excellent storyteller. So we're going to hear him break down something that we try to get across on a weekly basis here at the BBC. Okay, play it out, Nathan. Too many of us confuse that the short-term impacts that we're having are producing long-term value or conversely, having no short-term impact means we're having no value. So for example, you can't go to the gym for nine hours and get into shape. It literally doesn't work, no matter how much effort you put in. But if you work out every single day for 20 minutes, guaranteed 100% you will get into shape. When will you get into shape? No clue, over time. And everyone's different. Some people a little quicker, some people a little slower. And yet we are 100% sure it'll 100% work. I just don't know when. And we're also obsessed with predicting when. It has to be this quarter, it has to be the end of the year, it has to be when we pay taxes. And I got very comfortable saying, I know that if I stick to the process, I know 100% it's gonna work, and I have to get comfortable that I have no control over when. And so the things that I wrote about in Start With One is the game plan that I have followed since I first wrote about it. All right, so the, what do you want to do? I want to go to the first section here. This okay. first section, so basically he was saying, yeah, we'll play out this first section again one more time here. It was confused that the short-term impacts that we're having are producing long-term value. So that one. That first one, that's actually for me one of the interesting ones. So, so the way I interpret this, right, is that, you know, we can do things that we think we're making progress. We think we're actually getting like genuinely better long-term or like this is a step in the right direction long-term when it's not at all, right? An example of that would be adapting to the meta, picking an OP champion, winning a bunch of games, thinking- Getting the LP, thinking I'm getting being the LP, a better player. That I'm being a better player. Mm. Building that OP item on the new patch, getting that bunch of LP, thinking that now I'm higher ranked, that means I'm a better player, right? That That is, for me, the way I interpret that in League of Legends. Did you have anything else that you wanted to no, add there? I agree. I think that's a great, uh, a great interpretation of... Is fake process part of that as well, Curtis? Yeah. Yeah, it's like, or, or yeah, even fake process, even like doing shitty reviews. Shitty, shitty, like a three block where you're like, it looks like I'm doing the... All those blocks that you just get wins. You just like, I just did a three block. I got lucky. I won three games. Yes, the process is working. Mm. But it's just three games. We don't know jack shit whether it is or not working. We have no idea, right? It's like a short-term little thing that, you know, you're like trying to jump the gun essentially, right? Um, but the main one, right, is that um, the second part of this was the opposite of that. So we'll play this out and again. Or conversely, having no short-term impact means we're having no value. So, for so that one, right, which is what we commonly that's see in the, our programs. Yes. That's the that's the big one, right? People giving up on the process. People being like, okay, you know, I've been doing this, you know, thing for months. You know, like, why am I not seeing results? What's going on? Am I just not talented? Yeah, and and you know how we we kind of talk on the BBC. You got to have blind faith, kind of in the process, and blind faith, and just trust that it's somehow going to work. He articulates that in kind of a much more clearer way. But that's really what we want to get across. For some people, they might, like he said, they might get in shape way sooner than others. Some people might take way way longer. Right at the end of the day, though, it will work one hundred percent of the time if you put in the effort and you follow this. You develop champ mastery. You have a small champ pool. You play with intensity. You play with three blocks. You review your games. You have a crack. You express your best self. You mute all. You do all this stuff. It will work one hundred and ten percent of the time. Mm. But we don't know when. We, we don't know when. know when we. It could. You could get. You could skyrocket to diamond for gold in three months. One person. It might take two years. I don't know. That's just the that's just the way we're, we're humans. We're just different. We're built different. Mm. I like at the end there. It's the key word: be comfortable not knowing when. That's a really important because a lot of people get angsty and just give up really quickly because it's like, well, I, it, yeah, you say, well, Nathan Curtis, I don't know when. What's the point? You know, I mean, but it could be never. But that's the hard thing. That is really the hardest thing for us humans. We really like to know that if we're doing something. We're following this process. We're, we're, you know, we're paying for coaching. We're playing these blocks. We're sticking. We're developing. Money, we're reviewing. We want to know when. We want to know that if I do this, when am I going to get the result? Give me Nathan? the answer, Curtis. Yeah. <laughs> when am I going to get it? And I don't know. That's yeah. the, that's the thing. I really don't know. It's like Curtis, you're so confident, Rally and Soul. You said you know step by step how to do everything. Like, mm. Yeah, cool. Curtis knows step by step because it's a challenger player. He can mm. learn that, pick that up way faster. 
Curtis can tell you, okay, well, this is genuinely the way you need to be thinking with the rallying soul in these type of games. But, you know, it's going to take... Because League of Legends is just a thing of like, okay, I'm doing this this game, but then something else weird happens. And then the next game, something else happens. And the next game, I'm making that mistake now. And then the next game, it's yeah. so much chaos. It's a whirlwind. It's, it's like a, you said, I love your now. It's a car crash. Oh, the improving in League... No, I think I call it a plane crash. A plane crash, it's, yeah. It's a disaster. It's a disaster. Dude. League of Legends is not sexy improving. Even our process is not... No. sexy and it never will be no even with the best coaches in the world yeah we have a really good idea of direction but other than the day still putting in that work going through that process is a shit show it's the execution again and 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 and, and what you said there you know people are so filled with angst it's the it's the emotions because humans are we're just emotional right we're emotional creatures it's the emotions that get in the way and make the process messy. Because think about it. If we were all hyper-logical robots that just play a game, play a game, play a game, no think, play a game, play a game, just process information, pattern recognition, <laughs> yeah. you know, of course we would... Get this information into here and I instantly know how to play this champion perfectly. Yeah, I know the matchup now. I will never forget it. You know, you know, that's... We're completely forgetting that humans... It's like, oh yeah, I have that painful experience that I remember I lost that game and I had, I, I've got a scar there, that a scar tissue mm. about that one. Or my, I remember my friend who made that champion is way better than the champion than me, so I can't learn that one. Or there can be an, 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 a mass amount of narratives and emotions and mm. things that get in the way of mm. us expressing our best self and getting into the details and actually learning. Mm. That's what makes humans so complex. We're so fucking complex. So complex. Right? A common one that the scenario that always comes to mind is the revisit of when you're really far you're 10, 15,000 gold ahead oh. and then you start getting lazy and sloppy oh. and then, or even like you, you're you at the nexus and you decide not to the nexus you want to farm some more kills oh. and then you lose it. That is something that we all need to be constantly reminded every couple of weeks, <laughs> even to months. You know what I mean? Like, and yes. what's the emotions there? The emotions is happiness. I want to get, we need to get the LP, but you got to cut out the happiness and be like, just be illogical in there. It's like, I'm just going to kill the Nexus and move on to the next game. Mm. Right. That's right. Yeah. And so again, it's, it's, you know, we talk a lot about, you know, respecting the solo queue journey and respecting the difficulty of the game. I think this is, is bigger picture. I think this is respecting the difficulty of being a functioning human being. <laughs> yeah. Like being like, <laughs> just it's hard to be a human, <laughs> you know, it's very difficult. It's hard day. on a day to day basis. Right. As you all know, right. Just doing, going through the day. There's being alive for a day. It's, it's hard. It's, it's hard work. <laughs> it's hard. It's hard work. <laughs> it's hard work. Um, do you want to move on to Summoner School? Yep, let's do Summoner School now. Now, this will actually tie pretty nicely, I think, if I can recall. Better, Nathan. By the way, the people that... um, The people that... The admins, was it? The moderators for the... Thing. Yeah, the moderators said that. Uh, because we last episode, we talked about Summoner School looking for moderators. Yep. And they were happy with the applications of the BBCers um, Great. who applied. Shout out, so. BBCers. Thanks for helping out the Summoner School. Representing us and doing some community service, you know, helping the... Uh, helping the community. Helping the community there being a mod for the Summoner School Reddit. So this is, yep, a post from the... Doing their Summoner time. School. Doing their... That's, <laughs> how, that's, that's, that's community you know what, service. What, it's, like, it's like the jury duty for the league community. Yeah. It's working it's for Summoner School. for society. Yeah. Because it's a volunteer. You don't get paid for that. <laughs> All right. Uh, the title of this thread is is it possible to learn a really difficult champ if you're bad at the game for context i'm not a complete noob been playing for more than a year now i know how to cs i know how to trade i know how to track jungle so on and so forth at a low silver level i bounce between different roles but my favorite is top lane and my favorite top laner is by far is fiora no other curry top matches the adrenaline i get from trying to kill them and heal with vitals faster than them trying to kill me. And that adrenaline keeps running until one of us dies. And you keep trying to 1v1, 1v2 people all game long. So win or lose, I still feel like I had a blast. Issue is, I suck her on her. I tried to pick her up a few times, but I inevitably get a game where I go 0 and 10 and give up. I'll try again when I know the game better, I tell myself. Okay, so he says, I'll try and play Fiora right. again when I know the game better. That's what he tells himself. Mm. I know if I really wanted to climb, I should play like Garen or Malphite or Dr. Mundo or something, but I really don't care about rank or winning or losing. If I did, I would play mid or jungle. Two roles I'm very comfortable with and way bigger impact on the game, kind of the reason I'm asking. 
I fell in love with Cassiopeia mid before, but no matter how many games I spammed on her, I could not get good with her. And I'll do way better playing, ran better randomly playing Ari. I'm really worried I'll spam like 50 Fiora games and I'll suck on her by the end of it. I think it's a very simple answer. No brainer. You got to do it. Yeah. Right? If you don't care, if that's what brings you genuine happiness in the game, you got to do it. Sort of going back to the Simon Sinek thing, right? Like, okay, yes, you're, you're going to take way longer to learn the game, but uh, because, you know, you're going to be misplaying mechanically and situation decisions that actually would be good, you're just harder to execute because you're stuffing up mechanical, you're getting behind early game, you just can't win the game anymore at that point. Um, yeah, you just need to be aware that it's going to be take a long time. Okay, you do say it's simple, Curtis, but we've actually just had... Um, I've talked about Simuli before in this podcast, mm. the Nidalee gold player. The Nidalee one. So he's recently just hit platinum, right? And playing he, Wukong, right? Playing Wukong yep. now, right? And uh, as another member mm. who's been in Solitude for like a year, he joined like uh, gold, stuck in platinum, like bouncing between plat one to plat two, plat three, even going into plat four for literally like eight months. Uh, was playing Volley Bear jungle. And then I put him onto Eve, clearer champ identity, better reference points in game, and got to Diamond Broke that point as well. So I'm having a lot of success in my program game of playing champions that are easier, when we say easier, better, re- more. Yeah, there's no doubt. Points. I totally agree. If he was playing for rank, like he said, hmm. right? The thing is, is that he says that he's having a blast. This is the thing where I think people trick themselves. Mm. Like, Samuli, they love those champions, mm. but it just wasn't. Well, this is again. It makes what, them hate the game. I, I, I know what you mean. I know where you're coming from, and this. Is, but I could, It depends if we want to take what he's saying at face value or not. Mm. Uh, that's the thing. I this don't is what's confusing, this. right? Yeah, you don't believe, and, no. and I, I totally understand that, and I, I don't know either, to be honest. It, it, so, if we were to trust what he's actually saying here, I don't quote. I don't care about rank or anything. I just care about Fiora. Then no shit. But what is a little bit of a red flag is if you don't care about rank, why would you even be? asking this question then, yes, right? Because exactly, then you'd just be exactly sitting here right. in an you're already playing Fiora, right? <laughs> yeah, you wouldn't care about <laughs> You wouldn't care, advice. right? So there's obviously a bit of a red flag yeah. there, right? So yeah, you're, uh, okay, you're, you're spot on in that regard. Well, if you get, if we get specific, like I, I look, I don't, th- again, I, I, I don't think we can generalize. Like I think this is where per- it's yeah, case right. by case basis. You right? said it. That's why you said, when you said you started with it's simple. It's not like, simple. This is a gray area again. It is a gray area because it depends on the personality, doesn't yeah. it? Because like if he was true to his word, exactly what he said, then it is simple. But we know that humans aren't simple, and he's probably saying one thing but feeling that's another right. thing. So, you know, okay, let's lay out the facts. Number one, climbing with Fury is going to be harder. Right? It's mechanically intensive. It's very unforgiving. If you get behind, you have little to no utility. So it's very hard. That's why you're going to have games where you go 0 10, right? It's a, it's a champion that really requires you know your matchups and you know how to manage your waves. Fact, period. That's just the way it is. Um, it has a very, very high skill cap. Uh, yeah, mechanically demanding. And because you have no utility and there's going to be a lot of ARAMs in your rank, you might find it difficult to be impactful in the mid to late game, right? Because the champ is predicated on split pushing and split pushing is a harder to execute strategy, I believe, um, in Solo queue in general. Like yes. typically, you know, playing Malphite and then going to mid and then Ring someone is a lot more effective. So those are all the facts, you know? And so, yes, you will have an easier time climbing with one of these simpler champions with clearer identities and ease of execution. Um... But uh, will that give you fun and satisfaction? We don't know because that's ultimately a very personal experience, right? Would you say though, Nathan, let's say he played one of these simpler champions and got to gold. What's going to change? Like, because I, what, I, what I'm worried about is like, what is actually going to change? The feeling of I'm getting better at champion and seeing results. It's sort of like you have to like go through that. But he, but he, but he's saying he's already climbed before in other roles, right? Like he's climbed with mid or whatever it was. Like it's not like he hasn't climbed before. I'm assuming. I mean, he hasn't. He didn't clearly state that, but he's. I think he said something about if I wanted rank, I could just play mid or whatever it mm. was, mm. Ari or whatever. So what was your question again? It was well, like my, 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 what's going to change? Let's say he gets the goal, right? Yeah. Let's say he gets the goal playing Malphite. Yeah. He's still theoretically going to have the same problems with Fiora, no? Well, not not exactly, because my philosophy with League of Legends is mm. you get to a higher rank, 
and then you get the feel of the game pace and the mechanics and that like automatically makes you a little mm, bit better like mm, subconsciously right yeah it's so hard for me to comment because i don't i i don't know like what fiora is like as a chance like in terms of how hard is yeah, she and, yeah, yeah. you know what i mean like i feel like it's really hard for us to comment from a mm. top lane perspective mm. i my gut is just telling me if you're if you truly believe what you say you're saying play fiora and struggle with yeah. it if you're on the I fence i just see that people just give up on that eventually after time again Samu was at this for seven eight months yeah. and we're just like all right this is too and he was generally getting yeah. a bit upset with it like okay i'm starting to see this this is ridiculous yeah. but he literally but, had the review that was the breaking point we're like what are we doing? I, I can't. I can't. This is. It's just too difficult to. But what? But, but I. I totally see where you're coming from. But where do you draw the line, though? Because at least in mid, I know. I know. There's a very big difference between someone trying to climb with a LeBlanc in say gold hmm. versus something that's like in the middle. It's still difficult but doable. Say like a. Let's say. Uh, let's say like a middle ground like like uh, i was gonna say zoe but zoe's kind of there with leblanc as well maybe like a an akali where it's like it's not what i would recommend or like ari okay ari is a great example ari is not a champ i recommend in gold because it doesn't have the clearest reference points and it's it actually will make your journey a little bit harder it's also quite mechanically intensive but there are ways to make it simpler by building Everfrost and you can give it a clear identity. There's ways to make that journey easier. Whereas there's no matter what you do with a LeBlanc or no matter what you do with an Azir or whatever, your journey is going to be fucking terrible mm. or TF or something, mm. right? And like those are the champs that I would, I would, I just, I just basically strongly, strongly, strongly recommend, please don't do this, mm. right? And we picked on a plat. Mm. I don't know where Fiora is on that scale. Where is she? Is she at the bottom like a, like an Azir or a TF? Or is she in that middle ground, like I said? Um, so yeah, that's why I. So, so that's why I, it's hard for me to comment. Like Nidalee, for the jungle perspective, is like the bottom yeah. of the it's barrel. Like the extreme, yeah. That's the extreme. Something in the middle, maybe like a. I don't know what's in the middle. Something that's hard and doesn't have the clearest reference. Maybe like a Gragas or something, right? I'm yeah, assuming. I'd say that's more close. I'm trying to think about middle ground. Like I don't know what that middle ground is. It's hard. It's definitely hard, but it's doable. Maybe like a, I think Karzix is right. You're gonna know how to play fights a little bit. You know, you sort right. of an assassin. You can't. Really you can't just dive in. Yeah, no, yeah. Full clearing. You're but it's doable. Clear, but it's doable. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. That's kind of what I mean. Like, where is it on that scale? Yeah. Where is it on that spectrum? Yeah. So, make of that what you will. I think. I think we've given enough him to think about at least. So we'll move on to the clips corner. Let's get into the details, guys. And welcome everyone to Curtis's Clip Corner. All right, we're in the Clips Corner. So this was a review I did this morning. I believe this is High Grandmaster EU, I believe. Um, so essentially playing Ari here, level seven, um, going for a recall, we're about eight minutes in the game. Right, to give a bit of context, the enemy, uh, sorry, his team killed the enemy bot lane Lulu. So they have a Zeri Blitzcrank bot. The Zeri Blitzcrank killed the Lulu. And the enemy has a Twitch Lulu bot side. And so what we're going to be talking about here is the importance of using lol states to uh, be aware of what's happening in the side, the side lane, specifically wave states okay you know a lot of people talk to me about roams and identifying roam windows there are many many aspects we're just gonna be talking about the one one aspect here today which is wave states wave states you're obsessed with wave states as a jungler wave states tell you a lot about what you can and can't do when it comes to roams so we're gonna play this out off this lull state he's coming out of base katarina end up overstaying here in the in the lane um and if he you know this ari hadn't pan camera anyway literally just looking at mid only Looks at mid, watching the Katarina clear the wave. He has no idea about what's happening with the wave top, has no idea about what's happening with the wave bot. Now, the reason this is very important is if you don't know what's happening with the waves and sides, how do you know what you're going to do when you get to the lane? You're going to catch the wave and then then what? Now you're going to have to think, now what do I do? 
right? If you had used the lull state to actually assess the map state and see specifically what's happening with the waves, you would already know now, before you're even remotely close to getting back to lane, roughly what you're going to be doing. You could at least rule out an option. Like, I'm definitely not going top, mm. or I'm definitely not going bot. Just the ruling out options enough is enough to help you know what to do. Yeah, at least it narrows down narrows stuff, down. right? So then... Can we just, uh, for new viewers, Curtis, what's yep. the lull state? Because we get sometimes yep. in the comments. So a lull state is essentially downtime in the game. So it can be a death time, it can be when you're dead, it can be when you're coming out of base. They're kind of like major lull states uh, of a reset. Then there's miniature lull states. They're the ones kind of in between the waves, right? Or like you have time where you're not interacting with the enemy laner, essentially. You have your mental sacks freed up. That's right. Your mental sacks freed up. So here she's coming out of base, right? So, you so have basically Ari should be collecting information to be aware of what to do after collecting this wave under tower. That's right. And the more... The information quicker. you can process in league, the better quality decision making. That's is, right. Yes. Right? Yeah. I always say the quality of decisions based on how much information you've got. That's right. Process. And so here, this Ari comes back to lane, not having processed any information about what's happening in the side lanes. The camera's just been mid the whole time, just sitting in the way. Chilling. And we'll see here. She gets back to lane. She clears the wave, and the Katarina bases in front of her face. Now, at this point, right now, she knows. She knows, I mean, if she had panned her camera, she would be aware that the enemy jungle is showing topside. Katarina is now in base. And what the key piece of information here that was missing is that the bot lane had the wave frozen as a Zeri blitzcrank into a Twitch Lulu. So then the next wave is, you know, barely at the tier two. She could have already been roaming bot right now um, with ultimate level a level eight Ari with a lost chapter and a Sork, incredibly strong. So strong right now. Right, really, really strong. And it's a free double kill. But instead, she just sits mid, she's chilling, and then Twilling eventually- Twilling her thumbs for the next wave for the next 15 seconds. Yeah, jerking off for 15 seconds. And then here, he, she, she pans her camera bot, but it's too late to pan your camera bot. The moment he saw this, he knew he fucked up. He knew he missed something the window, yeah. He, well, I don't know. He didn't say that, but- Oh, well, you that's know, problematic but, then. But um, that's... I would expect know. a Grandmaster player to know that they right. lost, missed a game-winning opportunity. Yeah. Right. Um, and so essentially, he missed this window because he, he pans his camera bot, but he's sitting in mid and he's too late now. The window's gone because the, the, they're going to be able to get that's the wave right. in. Yes. And now they're heavy trading with the with the big wave frozen. This would have been a huge free double kill, essentially. But then he just, he just shoves the wave and then that's it. Missed opportunity, boom. Game change. And the game was dead even at that point. That's how you accelerate and take over game. Yep, that's a huge missed opportunity. Double kill bot lane. Bot lane's exploded. That's I would, it. I would even say that mistake's unacceptable for a Diamond 4 player. Would you agree, Curtis? I would say the way like, we coach... Like in, in the review, or like well, the way I think about well, it. Well, I would say the way we coach... We would hope that a diamond player is using lull states to see that stuff. That's, that's the fundamental, using lull that's states correct. to um, identify aggressive opportunities. We believe that, that well, the way we view the game, we believe that that is a skill that one should have as a habit by diamond. Yes. That doesn't mean that one can't get to grandmaster without it, but it makes it harder. That means mm. you have to over-index in other skills. This person is probably very good mechanically. Yeah. Maybe a lot of champ mastery, good team fighting. Who knows? I don't know. My point being, and this is for all of you guys out there, you when you're, especially as a, I mean, this is for junglers as well, but I'm going to say just in front of reference of mid laners, but this is going for everyone. Use your lull states to assess what's happening around the map and emphasize wave states because wave states give you a lot of information about what you can and can't do. Yeah, the game's all about waves. That's how we know what we can, yeah, what plays we can make. I want to apply another principle here, Curtis. Mm -hmm. I say once uh, for jungles a little bit later in time, but I guess mid laners can do things pretty early because they get their ultimates pretty much before everyone else on the map. But the when you get to like eight minutes, I usually say the 10 to 14 minute mark, you need to stop being hyper efficient and just hitting every wave and every camp and start thinking about how do I win the game? I think it's a really important time in the game, I've noticed, because that's when Herald's up, second dragons are up. It's That's that's where games accelerate the most. Um, obviously, other games are important, but that's what I find a lot. It's interesting you say that, because sometimes it's eight, but for me, I typically say 10 minutes. Yeah, I say, I mean... Sometimes eight, it's this eight. Is, this is eight minutes now, but I'll say most of the time, it's the 10 to 14 10. minute mark. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I was... Because uh, that's when I have a rule still up. in my gameplay, and I talk about to other people in the Midland Academy, that you should never freeze the wave post 10 minutes. 
Love it. Like basically, that's so ever. interesting. Yeah, because I say stop doing. You can't full sequence anymore after yep. ten minutes. You can only do a quadrants. I mean, you can obviously sometimes full clear. Obviously, yeah. rules are made to be broken. Exam. Like you can sometimes freeze very but situationally. You got to be thinking about how to win the game. That's right. right. Even if pressure playing... matters a lot post ten minutes because shit's going on. The yep. shit sits the fan usually. You can break towers fast. It's interesting you say that because I also one of the reasons I believe that to be the case is people start to have key components and key items yeah. as well. People get their key breakpoints a lot of the time. Like, like here, we're at 8.30 and Ari has a lost chapter and a tier two boots. Like, you know, a lot of champions come online or have major components can get shit done. That's a good explanation for it. I never sort of explain it. I, that's, mm. I just say that people have to believe me because it's like a right. full thing. Right. I just have a feel because I've just known because I just win. I win most of my right. games between the 10 to 14 minute mark. Right. Yeah. Cool. Awesome. Great stuff. Mailbag time. Yep. Away we go. Mm. Alrighty then. Our first question here comes from iSantic from the EUNE server. Dear Nathan and Curtis, I've discovered your podcast recently for about a few weeks. Since then, I've watched it a lot and it helped me at my lowest point. A bit about myself, I've been playing leagues in season three, but with long breaks in between, uh, breaks for months and a point for a whole year. My peak besides this season was promos for Diamond um when there was still a plat five diamond five i think it was the last season that um yeah division was split into five so last year i started to play again and wanted to climb seriously i was hard set gold four and i felt rusted and bad but it was a hardware issue i had a bad laptop and had around 70 to 80 frames per second at the lowest video quality since i bought my pc i got to plat in five days with around uh, a 36 to 5 record so in summary he's peaked at diamond promo so plat one and then he took a break, stuck in gold. He said it was because it was hardware issues. And then he got a new computer and then got to plat with a 36-5 record. I felt like I could finally move uh, with my champion smoothly. I peaked plat one again, but after Cassante was released, I really resonated a lot with him. I picked it up really fast and felt like the playstyle suited me very well. As I was a top main playing Yasuo Yon, it felt that after Plat 2, I was easily punished by tanks and bruises in teamfights and sometimes in lane. But Cassante felt like the best combination of both worlds. I reached Diamond 2 with him this season. In the first two months with a 62% win rate, with around 210 games. It felt really good, but now I understand that my ELO was a bit inflated since the champion was so incredibly broken. After the huge nerf to his ultimate and after the LP changes, I went from when win to from one win to diamond one down to diamond four it was a bad loss streak and i felt very entitled so i became very toxic so toxic that i got permanently banned and well deserved permanently banned i had another account in goal one with few games and good lp games but my entitled mindset ruined that account extremely bad this is when i discovered your podcast i learned to accept my current level of skill and tried to fix the account but it felt completely doomed I made another account and tried to stick with Cassante since it felt like the best champion for me. The account was leveled up by myself, not bought. I took that account from Bronze 2 to Diamond 4 in about a month. From Plat 1 to Diamond 4, I played with the pre-made and I felt like that helped me as well. My duo was at the same level as me, Plat 1. Now I play on the account a game or two a day. It is close to Diamond 3 and play mostly on my Doomed account that is now Platinum 3. I wanted to play on the Platinum 3 Doomed account to expand my champ pool but when i go back to my diamond account and play cassante i feel like i'm becoming a bit rusty so now i play on the low account with both cassante and other champions like set and scion so it sounds like he's learning those champs some somehow even if i feel like i contribute a lot in my diamond wins and i play good when i go back to my doomed plat three account it feels like i'm not a diamond player and i play like a plat two or plat three my question for you what should i do i keep playing more on the main account to increase my skill and learn more about the game or should i try to solidify my skills and discipline on that doomed account and try to fix it also while expanding my champ pool wow okay there's a lot there to unpack well i'm i am a fan of a, of a second account for learning Learn champions, champions yep. i think that's very important and it's great it's your second account of learning champs is you know going to be about three four hundred lp below yep you know your, your where your main champs and your main account is Yep. Um, so I would recommend doing the, the second... Okay, I talk about the two for one ratio. Two blocks of the new champion on your second account for every one block of your main champion on your main account. So 
you know, for you, let's say you, you want to learn Scion, right? Because you don't, you can't really learn two champs at once, by the way, just one. So let's say you want to specialize in Scion, learn Scion. Two, you do six games of Scion on that second account for every three games of Cassante on your main account. Do that up until Scion is at a relatively solid level. There might be 30 games. It might be 40 games. It might be 50 games. I don't know. It depends on how, right, how long he takes to click for you. And then he's now integrated. And now you do the same process for set. Two blocks of set for every one block of Scion Cassante. Rinse, repeat. Do that. And then, you know, before you know it, you have a champ pool of three. And that should... He's and then like he's... never... Don't... Then stop playing on the second account altogether. Yes. That will get rid of... He says he's concerned about getting rusty because he's learned new champs in Platinum and he feels like he's a genuine Platinum player there. Uh, this will help the rust by playing... You're yep. still playing, you know, your three-game block and then, you, you know, the three to six ratio, there, the two-to-one yep. ratio. Two-to-one, right? yep. Two-to-one ratio. Um, yeah, and he's got this fascination with, like, fixing this account. Like, the title of the email is fixing an account. No. Can, but I don't really think it's worth your while. I think that you should really be focusing on you play playing at your level of play, getting better. Yeah. Don't worry about that for now. No. Not important. So just keep it very simple, follow that process, and then that's it. I think you're on the right track. And by, by the way, one thing I really want to give you props for and compliment you for, man, is the awareness, the self-awareness to actually recognize uh, why you got to a rank. Like not a, people, not a lot of any people actually... Um, come to terms with that because hmm. he did play Cassante during when it was really quite overpowered got released, and he yeah. but to, to have the actual I guess like putting his ego aside to say you know I actually genuinely was inflated that wasn't a real rank and kind of coming to terms with that obviously he didn't in the moment but in hindsight I think that's a really really mature and respectable thing and yeah. it's not easy to do and that's going to help his journey overall because he's understand yeah. what's going on like that's what a lot of our podcast and our coaching is is like we're, we're understanding why we're at our skill level based on our journey. You, know, you talk a lot about when you get new clients that come in is you need to know sort of their background so that which will help you identify where they're at now so then you know what for them to work on. Yeah, and that's, yeah, this is really what the main, one of the main messages of the podcast is 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 developing introspection and, and, and giving context. Why, basically why, why and everything. Why are we at our rank? Why is it taking so long? Why, 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 why? And then that's where understanding your league history, your gaming background, understanding your lack of process or whatever it might Getting be. Getting to the review, understanding your decision making. His situation with his laptop, that's another why. Yep. It's all about asking why. And that helps. It helps with your mental health, with managing expectations, it helps with your relationship with Solo Cube. All right, here's a quick success story. Sometimes we like seeing success stories here. Uh, finally reached my goal. This is from Omar. Hello, Nathan and Curse. I'm sending you guys this email because this season I finally reached my goal of reaching Diamond. After starting my journey in season 11 as a Teemo main, becoming a Shen one trick and reaching Platinum in my first season, I thought Diamond was going to be easy work. I previously sent you guys an email asking if I was on the right track and following the advice you gave me absolutely worked. Coming from playing around 1,500 games first season and not really playing ranked last season, I can confirm to all the BBC listeners out there that using and following the three-block rule is a must for ranking up. Like you guys have said time and time again, sticking to a core champ pool, in my case, Vex, Pantheon, and Victor, and reviewing games are key in capitals. I just want to, I just want to let you guys know I'm very happy that I found this podcast this season. It really made the difference. Awesome. Congratulations, Omar. Put in the work, you get the results. And this is tying back to what Simon Sinek said, right? It will work 100% of the time. We know it will work. And it's these success stories that we're hoping that get people to do it, get people over the edge. Get people to trust the pro like the blind process. You yep. know, that no, it's going to take time. You might be slower than... We don't know when it will, you know, work, but we know it will work. Be comfortable not knowing when. All right, next one here. Car... Champion Mastery, how do I learn if I'm the one leading the path? This is from AJ from them. Yeah, this is, I wanted him, to, I told him to send this one in because this is a very interesting one. Hi, Curtis and Nathan. My name's AJ, but I'm also known as Ajax in MLA. I watched BBC episode 150, which is the most recent one in time. I'm writing this. You guys explored the idea of Champion Mastery, how important it is, and how to learn from others on a champion. My question is, how do I learn if I'm the if I'm the one people are looking for improvement, two for improvement. For context, I'm a 750 LP Grandmaster Yone 2 trick. 
uh, on the NA server. My goal is to maintain and reach Challenger. Over the course of two seasons, I've been going on and off Challenger, and I want to not just reach Challenger, but go to mid-Challenger and maintain it. That's the key one. He wants to maintain it. I'll just hover and bounce in Challenger and Grandmaster. So guys, in the BBC example that Curtis mentioned in episode 150, we were comparing Curtis's Aurelian Soul to a Grandmaster level Aurelian Soul, and I got, a, I got a lot of great learnings from him. But my issue, which could be a narrative in itself, is that there is simply not a single other person on any major region who plays Yone mid as much as me as this high of, of an LP. Literally every other Yone player either plays him on you know only 20 to 25% of games in lower LP than me, or plays him in a different role, top over mid, or uses him purely as a counter pick or in games that are good for him. So I'm really struggling to figure out how I can see what I don't know and level up my Yone and consistently reach Challenger. Obviously, I'm doing things wrong in my games on Yone that's limiting me from climbing, seeing as I'm stuck at around 700 750 LP, but I've been struggling to prevent any narratives from creeping in. Like, this is the limit of this champ, or no one else is Challenger on Yone mid, so therefore it is impossible. Players like Dzukil... Uh, who I greatly respect because I don't see anyone else purely one trick Yone plays him top, which he has much different strengths and weaknesses top compared to mid. PZ Zhang usually plays Yone top and tries to avoid him mid, and he's more of a Yasuo main anyway. Players like Chovy are just better fundamentally and doesn't need extreme champ mastery because his fundamentals are just that much better. Is it really just I'm lacking the execution on the fundamentals all around the board and that's what's causing me not to climb on Yone? Of course, I play Syndra RE2 when it looks good, but I'm mainly playing Yone purely because I want to prove to myself that I can reach Challenger and maintain Challenger again on Yone. I also just have the most fun on him, so I tend to play him more than other champions. Of course, going into the details and grinding and having a difficult journey um, is and has been tons of fun for me. I just can't help these narratives from creeping in sometimes, especially when I do well in GM level games, then get absolutely blasted in challenger lobbies with Yone. Part of it is probably an ego protection mechanism by, by, by blaming a part on the champion, but I couldn't help but feel helpless when at 1.2, uh, when a 1.2k LP Tristana players just perma keeping me under turret and solo winning the game because we can't take any fights. Love to hear your takes on this discussion. I thought you would be an interesting person to answer this question mm. because of your experiences, both with like back in the day, you, you were, because you're more of an innovator than me. And, and even nowadays, like you play a lot of champs that not many other people play and you kind of just do it your own way and you kind of path the way or pave the way. Sorry. So yeah, I just wanted to kind of get your thoughts on this. I think the first thing is first accepting like where you're at in the general idea of the player base. Like, um, you are in the top zeros like if you want to be pushing with this champion higher like yes you've got to be very good like you know you just said like trophy level and stuff like that can play this so i'm not saying it's in impossible but you definitely need to understand that this is a, a a goddamn feat like uh i was actually when i was going to like my rexai mental blocks and stuff like that because i thought i generally couldn't get higher with rexai than like you know last year i was like 850 lp challenge or whatever i was like bouncing between that 900 uh, there was that 14 Peaks documentary of that guy that did that impossible challenge, like that not everyone thought was just impossible. And that was really inspiring. But like, you know, this guy is like the best of the best. Like, again, like, because obviously this is the key thing is like, we, we always want to be feeling progress as humans, but you're at a point, this is not, not relatable to pretty much anyone else. You're at a point where you're, you are going to start seeing the champion limits and you're going to have to become a fundamentally better player, which is you're going to have to bust your balls way harder than to just start a mid or any other player. But the good news is that you'll actually become a better player by going through this, this really tough journey. But you've got to accept that this is in, insanely hard and the, you know, the haters or, you know, the narratives might be right. It might actually be impossible to be a top 20 Yone mid, only one trick that gets counter picked a lot. I don't play Yone, so I don't know how hard the counters are and how hard it is to, um, you know, win some certain games. Um, but yeah, I think that's the key thing is like, yes, this is, the question was, you know, pave and lead in the way, how do I do it? I don't really know, honestly. You're going to have to bust your balls, you know? It reminds me of, I don't know if he has watched it, if you haven't, Ajax, the, the Dawn Wall. Yeah, that's another one as that's well. That's another one. I feel like really resonates with this because there's that part, right? Where it's like that impossible part. Like he's just staring at a wall and no one's done it before. Mm. He's like, he's like studying the wall for how long? Like 
20 years or whatever it was. Oh, like, no, ridiculous. No, he moved out to the location. I think he started for five years. Was yeah. it? Or oh, just on that one part of one the part of the wall yeah. or something, right? Like trying to figure out a way. Like you should watch the documentary, but like that level of obsession. Yeah, that's the thing. It would take years. It takes years type yes. thing, right? Like because the journey is so goddamn difficult and like you're having to, yeah, but like you said, come fundamentally a better player. Not just with Yone, but just holistically in every possible way, mechanically understanding the game, breaking down win conditions, everything to make it work. And again, I, I don't think anyone is going to... We don't know if it's impossible. That's like with anything, right? Mm. Like you could say that about anything. People breaking like a world record. It's in like that of, marathon runner as well, that guy yeah. who broke the two-hour marathon or whatever that like as well. that. And, it, and all it takes is one person to do it and then typically everyone else can follow. So if you want to be the person that's breaking that record the first time, that's a special individual. They're always very special individuals. Yeah. And, you know, we'll never know. And again, that's where if you want to go down that route, it's going to take years. And that's a pretty cool thing to do if you want to do that. That's, that's a, a challenge. That's a challenge, a cool challenge. I mean, if you and you enjoy Yone, I think that's a pretty awesome challenge. Um, and we chip away and like, there's always things he could do better, right? Little things, but you know, really, I think the question that it's all going to come down to is, does he want to do this? Does he want to do this? Cause he could easily play other champions more. And because, you or, know, or just, or just accepting, this is sort of where I was sort of at my Rex eye, um, especially since I'm so, so busy with other things. Like, cause I just knew I just didn't have the time to push for this challenge. It's like, I just accept, okay, I'm just going to hover around of like, you know, low challenger and high GM. And that's just what I'm just comfortable. That's just my player, my level of play with this champion. Because of your real life situation. Yeah. Right. Like, I, I decided not to embark on that journey. Right. Because it, to, to, to embark on that be. journey, it's going to require a lot of time, a lot of effort. And yeah. it doesn't make sense for you right now with, what's going on no. right and that's for him i don't know what he said i think he's finished college so i, I think he's already finished he got his degree or whatever so I, I don't know what your situation's like you're gonna get a job soon i think he's looking for an internship or whatever so you know you might have to think well do you are you gonna have enough physically have enough time in the day to pursue this goal and chance probably might not right you're not gonna be a full-time streamer you're not a full-time solo key player you're not a pro player so i don't know right that's a really that's, that's a really good point so um ultimately this is a very personal it's a very personal journey i think as well right it's, it's ultimately all going to be on him what he wants to get out of it so i think watch the dawn wall watch was it 12 peaks or 14, 14 peaks? peaks i think on netflix yeah. watch those two documentaries um and then i think yeah i think probably studying chovy is your best bet i i would assume and then i would also say you know do some in-depth reflection what do you want to get out of your league solo queue journey what's the most satisfying thing to you would sitting there for three years chipping away trying to be the best yone in the world um arguably the best mid yone player in the one trick in the world be something that interests you or would you prefer to expand your pool, be a high mid to high challenger player which i'm very confident he could get with a more well-rounded robust champion pool playing the drafts a little bit better that's on you that's on him right another one as well just thinking about um you know, Dawn War and, and the, those documentaries, they had teams of people, hmm. you know? So maybe this would be like, you know, discussing with the best- Maybe he needs Euro to go to all the Yone players. Yeah, all the Yone all players. The Yone and, just, players. To, and just get them to review the games. Even like lower ELO Yone players. Yeah. Yeah. I, like go to, even if you can get a get contact- perspectives. Yeah, for the EU. Maybe even try and contact Zookill if you can. Yeah. Write him an email and say, yeah. look, I'm really trying to do this with mid- Here's an example of a game. I don't know how would you, even though he might not have the best answer, he might say one thing. That's all it takes. One perspective, one different thing. Oh, interesting. He would use R that way or he would have E that or he would have said no to that fire. Why? You know, just getting different takes. I think that's a, yeah, that's a really good point. Pretty much any great accomplishment by man is required of multiple people, you know. So I wouldn't I wouldn't even actually, wouldn't even be embarking this on yourself. Mm -hmm. If I wanted to take my Rex to Lex level, like, yeah, I'll be... Reaching out to other Rex. Like, there's that Roy Demon guy on, on EU. He's like the you know the best rex he's like gets to like yeah 1k lp on eu and stuff that's what about the chinese rex that that's in ours dude oh uh, yeah that guy was yeah, pretty that good guy, yeah that's it as well i think he's disappeared now yeah though, i don't know where he's back to china or something yeah um he's pretty good but yeah like stuff like that that's what you would do all right um next question here comes from perry the title is in was process for wild rift hi nathan and curtis i used to play league but i switched over to wild rift um, ever since it came out. Long story short, I was more comfortable on mobile controls and are now um, in high elo, master tier. Even though I don't play League, I still listen to the podcast weekly and have used the process on Wild Rift to great success. The two games are very similar, but one of the differences is the short game time. Since Elder Dragon spawns at 20 minutes every game, no matter what, 
Games generally last 20 minutes um, at its longest, and a 30-minute game is like a 1 in 100 games. With the shorter game time, a 3-block while queuing up, champ select and review takes about 1 hour and 30 minutes. Currently, I play only a 3-block a day, and with more free time now in the summer vacation, I'm looking to get in more games. What would be a good pro- What would a good process be? Perhaps a four, perhaps four or five blocks instead, or maybe two by three blocks with a break of X mins in between. Additionally, considering the short game duration, do you guys think a three block a day on my regular schedule, um, non vacation time is good? Thanks. Well, I want to be careful here. We want to preface this by saying we haven't played Wild Rift, Wild Rift seriously. So take that, make that of what you will. What I will say here is that because the game, I've pl- I have dabbled in Wild Rift and the game pace is significantly faster. So what I'm potentially concerned about, even though the raw games are shorter and that like doing a three block is a shorter time span, I think there's more uptime. Like in League, like there's a lot, like the lol, the lol states are more elongated, mm-hmm. you know, mm-hmm. and, and, and stuff like that. So what I'm, I'm not saying League has much downtime, but maybe there's something there in terms of, because of how much is happening in the game so fast, it might just be more that Mentally next level. In. Yeah, yeah so, maybe. Ba- so you're basically saying that maybe for every two hours of Wild Rift could be three hours yeah. of League of Legends. So maybe what he's doing is correct, right? Maybe even though that three block takes an hour and a half, maybe it's a more intense hour and a half than what a, a three block in League would be. Because I don't know. I'm remember, just the, the purpose of the three block is we're trying to figure out how long can we have high intensity and focus That's right. for the longest period of time. We found that three games is, is a nice convenient for the most part solid number yeah for some people it's two for some people it's four for the average person it typically is three yeah so you need to yeah you're spot on you need he needs to actually do some reflection right and introspection and i guess try try a four block try a two block what feels good but you got to remember especially when you're pushing the limits as well at the higher echelons you do got to you have to get games in right mm-hmm. like in my opinion no matter what game you play like you got to get those raw games in yeah. so like even though yeah your review quality is important you know ideally if you can you're getting that second three block in as well especially if it's only an hour and a half like i would be ideally try and push to two three blocks all right i'm just spit more on here yeah. um anything else you would add no nope. i think that's he needs to figure that out we don't play Wild Rift. No. Um, I think that in just in terms of just sitting down for a long period of time as well, like I think it'll be great. I, I, my instinct here is two, three blocks. Like you, yeah. you play for an hour and a half, go do stuff, come back another hour and a half. Because then, then you get to like think about stuff, the game and stuff in that time that you, because you could like, you know, you, know, you can easily tilt playing four or five games in a row. Yeah, and and and, and it, it, he said he's what is he going on break or something? He said summer. He's vacation. on vacation. Yeah. yeah, I mean, it, like I have told this to people. Like there are people in the Midnight Academy that do three three blocks a day. In order to do that, though, you would have to wake up early and you, you have your morning block, your midday block, and your afternoon block. Right, that's a very intense day. And if you do do that, and there, and I think that is good to do for some people, you want to make sure you're not doing that seven days a week. Like you can do the three, three blocks, but if you're going to do three, three blocks a day, that's like more of like a five day a week, mm. four day a week, mm. even thing. Mm. Like that's a lot of time, a lot of energy and you need to really mix you that can, up. You can forget what's going on Very like, in general. Like, what am I doing? Like, what's the champs I'm playing? Like, am yeah. I actually improving at the game? You can get bogged down so quick. I, I would say straight up, let's, let's do this as a thought experiment, Nathan. Let's say for whatever reason, someone we decided to go full-time solo queue players and the goal was that we're full-time solo queue for a year and the and there was the competition to get as high rank as you possibly could and get as best of the game as you possibly could walk me through what you would what how your schedule would look like on a daily basis okay so i would definitely love to i need to start with exercise first then shower, then eat, then play. Uh, that's that's when I'm most intensity. Then I play my we'll play a three. So block. you would, would wake up straight into exercise. straight into gym. Yeah, whether that's gym or running or whatever. Something, some form of exercise. Yeah. Straight into eat, shower, whatever. Yeah. Then block. your first three block. Yeah. Okay. Then what? So <sighs> in three block, would you do game review, game review? How do you do your reviews? Yeah, game review, game review, game review. Okay. And then then what? And then I'll take another hour break or so go do something maybe even just go to a different get get out of my pc room whatever that looks like Mm -hmm. then another three i actually would i would actually be comfortable maybe doing four games maybe in this because this is where i feel like i'm 
going to mm. be at my best for the day. Yep. Um, four games and then go get food. Yep. Another hour break. And then I'd finish off with that would be distinct on base how I'm feeling that day. I might play two games. I might play three games after and that would be it. That's my ideal. That's my theoretical ideal. I've never done it before. Mm. Okay. Oh, well, that would be a starting point anyway. Yeah. Okay. Mine would be kind of similar. I would say uh, I I think what I would do if I had all the time in the world and had no, nothing else to think about, I think I would do a morning. I wouldn't exercise before, but I would do a morning walk. I think I would wake up, do a morning walk, have like two cups of coffee and then eat. And then I would play. Um, and then while I'm actually, actually before I play, I would have like maybe 10, 15 minutes of looking at my games the last day. So to get my brain in the right, thinking about what am I, what was I doing? What was I, what mindset was I in? What were the matchups like? Just kind of, I would watch over stuff. That's a really good point. Like that's that what one. I found for yeah, me works really that's, well. That's good. Then I would play a four block game review, game review, game review, game review. Then I would gym. And then I would eat mm. and then I would shower. Then I would do a three block. That, that's interesting. I'll definitely be keen to experiment with that one as well. And then, and it's, and same thing, even before that block, just do a slight, like maybe a five minute, just skim over what happened that last block while I'm in queue type thing, three block. And then, um, and then, dep and then depending on like how I'm feeling and energy levels, um, uh, watch maybe like a pro vod or something maybe watch like maybe do a like half an hour of watching some matchups studying matchups or watching a tro some trophy vods something like that now on days where maybe i feel like i'm missing something and i don't need to get in rip my execution is good but i feel like i'm missing something i would actually maybe shorten that second block make that a two block and then i would have like a do 1v1s or do um study matchups or again watch pro vods so some, that's, and then the day's done. That's what my thing I would do. I like it. So that's our schedules. And if he's got the time, yep. that's gain inspiration there. Make of that what you will. And I think I would also do a journal. 100%. Okay, we're going for, okay. You, like I'll do a solo queue journal. Doing lots of things outside of the game as well. Like the solo queue, like a solo, like a reflection on my day. Yeah. And like get down my thoughts yes, and make peace. Like good. I would, I, I'm a big, like when we talk about making peace with the day. Yeah. Like I would really want to do that. Yeah. Because especially if you're thinking about getting better at the game all the time, it'd be very easy to get jacked up. Yeah. You need mentally. to, you need to structure your thoughts. Yes. And writing them down is very good. Yes. If I was going to do that, that's exactly what I would do. I like it. Um, yeah. All right. Well, we're going full-time solo queue next year. <laughs> <laughs> that's the dream right there, man. That would be the dream. Going to Korea. Imagine that. Imagine doing that for a year. How good you would get. Probably pretty good. Who knows? It might take more than that. As Simon Simon Cynic says, it could take. That's right. You know. All right. Good work, guys. Our cameras just died. Perfect timing. Yep. We'll see you guys on next Bye -bye. episode.